<laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Varma. He's uh, joining us from the Cleveland Clinic. He did his initial training in the UK and then did his EP fellowship at Beth Israel. Welcome. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Lakiredi for inviting me to this splendid symposium. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try and identify who is the right CRT candidate. This really is a patient selection conundrum, and it's becoming uh, more and more interesting as well as more and more difficult. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to address heart failure mortality. And as the uh, left ventricle remodels and the left ventricle dilates, ejection fraction drops, functional class deteriorates, mortality increases. Ejection fraction is less than 20%, functional class 4 has a two-year mortality rate of almost 50%. It's really a disease like a cancer. It's, uh, it has a greater morbidity and mortality than many tumors, but it's not always regarded as. So how can we do? How can we address this? We know that as uh, mortality, um, as uh, remodeling occurs, that functional class deteriorates and sudden cardiac death risk uh, decreases. But that is uh, taken care of with defibrillator therapy. Pump function as a factor in mortality increases. Coincidentally, the incidence of a prolonged PRS also increases. It increases to almost 30% once function class is deteriorated. Perhaps there's an association. And this was the uh, rationale for CRT initially, really applied to left bundle branch block. On the right, you see a schematic where you see slow transeptal conduction, slow intraventricular conduction, and late activated postrolateral left ventricle. That is the basis of a wide QRS, electrical dyssynchrony. This leads to mechanical dyssynchrony, intraventricular and interventricular uh, dyssynchrony, which reduces pump function. However, all of our uh, methods for identifying dyssynchrony as a selection criterion for a CRT have not been conclusive. So this has really been abandoned for the time being at least. Uh, as an identification of the right candidate. Electrical dyssynchrony is what we're working with, and this has become more and more important. So the initial trials really addressed class three and class four heart failure, and the major ones were uh, companion and care HF. I was trying to uh, locate the uh, cursor on this. Uh, in any case, the top table shows the results of these trials, large trials. Uh, okay, doesn't work very well. All right. Um, so anyway, CRT was found to confer a survival benefit, importantly incremental to best pharmacotherapy. And you see down here that we have uh, the, the various drug trials that have come through with ACE inhibition and beta blockers and aldosterone inhibitors, all of which have impacted heart failure mortality. But CRT is additional to that. It improves mortality from those trials of more than 30% in this group. So it's a very important therapy. And attention has really become directed to expanding the indications to be more inclusive and also identifying uh, the right candidates. So. The ideal candidate, to recap, in 2008 was a patient with an ejection fraction less than 35%, a QRS duration, whatever pattern, of more than 120 milliseconds, sinus rhythm, and class three and class four heart failure. However, there was a significant non-response rate, which Dr. Dober addressed earlier on, almost 30%. So can we reduce that as well as increase uh, indications for CRT, so more people can benefit from this potentially life-saving therapy. So certain guidelines have addressed the data that have come out in the last three or four years uh, on this topic in the U U.S. in 2012 and more recently in 2013 from the ESC. And they have really addressed some of the major trials data that have emerged addressing heart failure class one and two. So although heart failure mortality is less when functional class uh, is better. These patients are still vulnerable to heart failure hospitalization. 
organizations, which is a significant source of morbidity, and perhaps intervening earlier prevents the remodeling process. Attention is focused on the QRS itself, both the width and the morphology, the impact of atrial fibrillation, of RV pacing, attention to the LV lead, because we deliver the LV lead according to the patient's anatomy, and sometimes this may actually determine the response. So the patient himself has, uh, has a if the patient's anatomy for the coronary sinus tributaries has an effect on his ultimate outcome. And then non-electrical factors have become identified, comorbidities. Many of these are unknown, but they also play a part, and renal dysfunction and gender have uh, become uh, increasingly important. So addressing class one and class two uh, patients, so three very large trials, much larger than the initial trials 10 years ago for class three and class four heart failure, looking at patients with an ejection fraction of less than 30%, um, and looking at all-cause mortality and also uh, heart failure hospitalizations. So made it CRT, oops, provided uh, seminal data for this. It was the largest trial, and this found survival free from heart failure events was reduced by 34%, a significant reduction in a short time period. And this was really provided by heart failure hospitalizations. The mortality was relatively uh, low in this group. Importantly, although these trials enrolled class one patients, they were a minority, only 18% in reverse and 15% in made it CRT. There were no definitive outcomes from this group of patients. The trial, hi the trial highlighted the importance of QRS morphology. Efficacy of CRT depends on QRS morphology. We see here that for left bundle branch block, the model the schematic that I uh, showed you earlier, CRT therapy reduced the probability of heart failure or death very significantly. In fact, most of the uh, positive effects of the trial were concentrated in this group of patients because in the non-left bundle branch block patients, there was no effect. There was no difference for CRTD therapy. Non-left bundle is right bundle and IVCDs, and you see no effect for right bundles in the left panel. And you see for IVCDs a trend possibly towards worsening. So the, so the effects of CRT are concentrated in left bundle branch block, and they can be observed within 12 months. And here the remodeling data or the reverse effects on remodeling, the uh, reduction in LV volumes on the left, improvement in ejection fraction of approximately 12% concentrated in the left bundle patients. And this is also from mated CRT. Male-female uh, difference here, which I'll address a little later. But going back to the QRS, QRS less than 150 had a less effect, uh, a less positive effect from CRT. Most of the uh, positive effects were concentrated with longer QRSs. So why is that? The longer the QRS, the wider it is, the more electrical desynchrony there should be. So then it makes sense that there's no benefit of CRT for QRSs of less than 120 to 149. And this was observed in all the class one and two trials. And retrospectively, looking at the earlier trials, the class three and four heart failure trials, in a meta-analysis, again, there was very little effect, if any, when the QRS was less than 150 milliseconds. So the 150 mark seems to be important. Similarly, there was no benefit in non-left bundle branch block a word of caution here, though, because most patients who have non-left bundle have QRSs of less than 150 milliseconds, so there's a little overlap here. We don't really know very much about left bundle patients who have QRSs less than 150 or non-left bundle patients with a QRS of more than 150. So this needs to be addressed in the future. Why is that important? Going back to the schematic, the actual LV activation delay seems to be important. That's tightly related to the QRS duration in left bundle branch block, not in non-left bundle branch patients. When you actually measure that activation delay from the onset of the QRS to the, to the latest activated LV site, when that number is more than 95 milliseconds, there was a very much increased chance of response. And this is from the SMART AV trial uh, published by uh, Mike Gold as first author. So why is that important? Well, when you look at LV activation times, according to QRS duration, 
Well, on the left, you see normal patients. Nobody has an LV activation time in excess of 100 milliseconds. If you look on the right, patients with left bundle branch block, almost all of them have an activation time of more than 100 milliseconds. But if you look at right bundle branch block, that's the third, the third box up there, it's split half-half. So you have a 50% chance of having a positive benefit when you have right bundle branch block pattern with a wider QRS of more than 150 milliseconds. So this is, why, this is the interaction between uh, QRS morphology and duration, and some of this has not been explored. But the, the uh, in updated indications account for this. So class one recommendations now, ejection fraction less than 35%, sinus rhythm as before, left bundle branch block, not just the wide QRS, left bundle branch block, duration of more than 150 milliseconds. Also now inclusive of class two heart failure, reflecting the large trials that have been published recently. Class two A recommendation for left bundle and QRS of 120 to 149. As I mentioned, some of these data are not very clear yet. This is class two A in the States. That is, it can be useful, but it's regarded as class one, a recommendation in the European guidelines. So an area of dissent reflecting that we actually don't have all uh, certain answers here. A new recommendation for non-left bundle branch block patients with a QRS of more than 150 because they're more predisposed to having LV activation delays. So what about atrial fibrillation? Very few data here. In fact, the very first CRT trial, Mustic AF, which is approximately 15 years old now in design, is the only randomized trial to address this. We have very few data. But the recommendations recognize that many patients do benefit. But they have to be committed to ventricular pacing. As, as was shown earlier, patients with fibrillation often have fusion, have reduced levels of uh, ventricular pacing. So there's no point in implanting a biventricular device if it's not going to uh, pace effectively. So the new guidelines suggest that this, this uh, a CRT can be useful in patients with AF. If the patient requires ventricular pacing or otherwise meets CRT criteria, or if they require AV nodal ablation or pharmacological rate control, to commit them to almost 100% ventricular pacing with CRT. So this is very important. The new guidelines don't take into account functional class, but this is based on an EF, based on an EF of 35%. This is exposed a little bit, with a little bit more clarity in the European guidelines here. And on the right, you see patients with a reduced EF and an uncontrollable heart rate and any QRS duration should be committed to AVJ ablation CRT. And on the left, they do include functional class. If the QRS is more than 120 on the left there, CRT is indicated, but they have to be committed to ventricular pacing. If the QRS is less than 120 and you have adequate rate control, then they don't need CRT. However, if you have inadequate rate control, then again, AVJ ablation and CRT. But very few data for atrial fibrillation, but many patients do respond. What about a need for right ventricular pacing? And this often comes up. So this is a patient, progressive tiredness over years, now limited to one flight of stairs, uh, low ejection fraction, ischemic cardiomyopathy, residual ischemia, QRS less than 120. So the patient's indicated for a prophylactic ICD. A dual chamber ICD in view of the chronotropic incompetence to pace the atrium. What is unknown is what happens to the AV interval. If the AV interval increases, then they may be committed to ventricular pacing. Or there are algorithms that protect from ventricular pacing, so you can just commit them to atrial pacing. And this is relatively unknown. So you have to pace the atrium and see. Why is right ventricular pacing poor? When the top right insert you see from the David study, that when you have unnecessary right ventricular pacing, for instance in the case uh, I just illustrated, then mortality increases. Well, why should that be? Well, going back to the schematic on the left here, when you pace the right ventricular apex, it's just like left bundle branch block. Or is it? Actually, it's worse. Because the interventricular conduction is the worst, the QRS is wider, so it's a worse condition. So we want to avoid right ventricular pacing. However, there are very few data here. If you look at the first two trials, there are 30 patients and 60 patients enrolled in those for de novo CRT versus RV apical pacing. 
very few data. Block heart failure, which was published recently, a larger series of patients, but in patients with better preserved ejection fraction of more than 40%, 40 to 45%, showing benefit. So again, we really don't know which patients to select, but we can use CRT, class 2A, and be useful for patients on best medical therapy with an anticipated requirement for significant ventricular pacing, significant described as more than 40%. And this is a modified recommendation. Before it was a 2B indication, but now it's recognized as being, can be useful. So this is something to be, to be aware of. What about patients who are already committed to RV pacing? No data, no data there, only single center studies. And this is one, and showing that you have a very wide QRS during right ventricular pacing in heart failure. It's worse than the, uh, worse LV conduction delay than occurs in left bundle branch block. And actually, if you upgrade them, most of these patients do very well. They do very well when you abbreviate the QRS. The usual factors of QRS duration, female gender, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy do not apply in this condition. But these, uh, these uh, features need to be addressed respectively. No data just now. Comorbidities, increasing interest in this. And uh, I can't point to it, but as you see, that line decreased. The linear line represents GFR. As it declines, then all-cause mortality, those are the white bars, increases dramatically. So a question arises, should we be implanting ICDs in patients with renal failure? Because prophylactic ICDs, at least. Uh, because the nature of the disease process itself, this comorbidity, is likely to overtake the arrhythmic risk. So this is a very interesting question. But for CRT, we have very few data. In fact, they're conflicting. We know that chronic kidney disease is common in patients undergoing CRT. It's, a, it's an accompanying comorbidity with high frequency, and it's associated with a higher mortality. But if you implant a CRT device, it may improve renal function. Some series show this. Again, no large data sets. So the jury is out on this. What about right ventricular failure? We know that that predisposes to a poorer prognosis generally, generally in the heart failure population. What's the impact of CRT here? Well, in one study in the top, right ventricular dysfunction is a powerful determinant of prognosis, but it did not diminish the prognostic benefits of CRT. This is from Care HF trial, class three, class four heart failure patients, relatively sick patients. And in the bottom, we see from made it CRT again, CRT was associated with an improvement in right ventricular failure. So right heart failure is not something we understand very well, but it's not a cause to preclude CRT. What about gender? Very interesting to, uh, uh, topic here, very interesting data from made it CRT. And when reanalyzed, some of the class three, class, heart four, class four heart failure trials show the same thing. The probability of improvement is much higher in women. In fact, from made it CRT, the probability of death was not decreased by CRTD versus ICD. Most of the positive effects in this trial were concentrated in women. So regrettably, I have to say that having a male gender is a significant comorbidity. LV pacing lead position, um, an area of intense interest. Non-apical positions, have been shown to be ineffective in two major large, uh, two large trials, two major trials. And it's actually achieved a class 2A indication. Uh, so the apical lead positions have been shown to have higher mortality, leading to non-apical preference for positions. So this is a class 2A indication in the European guidelines. We prefer lateral. We don't know about the anterior positions. It becomes very complicated because in ischemic patients, to avoid postrolateral scar, there's no point in pacing into scar. But we don't have any, many prospective data on this. We don't routinely look for scar and then cite our lead accordingly. We don't have choices with lead positions either, particularly when we implant endocardially via the CS to an epicardial location. Site of maximal mechanical delay may be a, a relatively uh, beneficial position. Maybe the effects of pacing matter, the pace QRS, the morphology. The duration abbreviation may correlate 
improvement, widening certainly correlates with deterioration. Perhaps we need multi-site pacing, Dr. Leclerc's slide that was shown earlier. Perhaps we need endocardial pacing, especially in non-responders. These are areas of intense investigations. So each individual patient has his own um, set of, uh, of limitations and possibilities for delivering an LV lead position. It becomes very, very complicated because, after all, this is an electrical therapy for an electrical condition. And when you look at the electrical effects, and this is non-invasive mapping of a patient receiving a BIV device with a quadrupolar lead. On the left is the intrinsic conduction. Red means early activation, blue is late. Uh, two different views, anteroposterior on the top, left lateral on the bottom. And in the bottom you see that blue area of the, of the posterolateral LV signifies late activation. Sim it uh, is equivalent to the schematic that I had shown you earlier, but this is a real life patient. The red is early activation. Above you see the right ventricle is activated. And we don't need to go through the details, but you see that the different pacing sites, and these are only a matter of a centimeter or two apart, can vastly change LV activation sequence. So lead position may matter. Perhaps you don't need to shift the positions very widely in order to change activation sequence. So lead positions are very interesting, but becoming more difficult to understand. So a summary of new changes. Uh, class one indications. There are limitations to QRS of more than 150. Uh, with left bundle branch block. Expansion to class two patients with left bundle branch block and QRS more than 150. A qualification, class four heart failure patients, really only about 10% of the trials have to be ambulatory status. There's an addition of a 2B status. The European guidelines did not accept this, but this is class one heart failure, ischemic cardiomyopathy, sinus rhythm, left bundle more than 150. There's a restriction. CRT is not recommended for patients with class one or two patients with non-left bundle less than 150. And it's not indicated for patients whose comorbidities and or frailty limit survival to less than one year, recognizing the major influence of comorbidities. But many of those are still unknown just now. So in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that uh, regarding the question of who is the optimal CRT candidate, the highest level of response is, is in those patients with a wider QRS with the left bundle morphology, females, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, without comorbidities such as atrial fibrillation, renal dysfunction, right heart failure. And if you're male with ischemic disease and narrow QRS and non-left bundle morphologies, you're really at the bottom of the pile, unfortunately. Thank you very much.